Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Richard Collada. Mr. Collada is the Acting Director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education, where he focuses his work on leveraging open data to create personalized learning experiences for all students. Mr. Collada is passionate about accelerating innovation in education and has a particular interest in games for learning, personalized learning, and open education. Mr. Collada lives in Northern Virginia with his wife and three children, so please join me in welcoming Richard Collada. Hello everyone, uh, glad to be here, finally. I uh, am not from uh, Washington, and I'm reminded <coughs> when I think I'm triple, quadruple padding the amount of time it takes me to go 12 blocks here, um, that I'm often wrong, and so, uh, I, as I learned today. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I had a chance to take a look over uh, the, the study that Ellen has, uh, has presented here, and I'm really looking forward with some more time to dive into it. Uh, having not been able to hear uh, the discussion thus far, but really want to just start by uh, congratulating Ellen and, and company and those that work uh, here at the Center on uh, Media and Human Development for this work. It's really, really important that we're looking at actual data around how media is being used. <laughs> it's very easy. So somebody, I have a, a little sign on my wall in my office, those of you who have been in there, that says, um, nothing dispels an anecdote faster than a small amount of real data. And, uh, and so one of the things that we need to be careful about is it's very easy to, uh, because media use is so personal to us, right, to, to, to quickly uh, assume that everybody is using media in the same way that we are. And we have to be particularly careful when it comes to things like policy uh, and, and making assumptions uh, that, that are, are not necessarily consistent across the country. So, so information like the information that we're <coughs> provided with today is very helpful in us thinking through some of those, uh, some of those issues. Let me just quickly say uh, just a, a, a sort of a 30 second uh, public service announcement about my office and what we do at the department in case those of you uh, that aren't familiar with our work kind of know the context <coughs> for what I'll be sharing today. Um, so I lead the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. And this is an interesting office because it's not a program office in the sense that we don't uh, run grant programs or things like that, like much of the department does. We're actually part of the office of the secretary, and our role is to help make sure good policy decisions related to technology are um, integrated and sort of connected with the different policy offices across the department. Uh, and so we, we try very hard to do that and been very involved with a number of recent projects you may be familiar with, uh, a project called Race to the Top District, which is uh, working to create model schools across the country that are using technology to personalize learning for students. And so that's clearly a, a, an area where we've been very involved in helping make sure the technology uh, is meaningful and, and working in the, the right way. Um, our office uh, develops the National Ed Tech Plan. And so again, as, as sort of part two of my public service announcement here, if you're not familiar with the National Ed Tech Plan, uh, feel free to take a look at that. It's, uh, it's free, uh, as you know, on our website, ed.gov slash technology. And it sets up the vision for how we believe technology should be used to power learning, to enhance educational opportunities, and to support teachers. Um, and you'll notice that, in fact, I had somebody the other day give me a hard time because technology was actually not mentioned as much as they had hoped, actual you know, tools, devices, in, in the report. And I went through it, and I did a couple word searches, and I found we actually hardly mention any devices or any actual sort of physical hardware software at all. And there are a couple mentions in some case studies that we have, but, but nothing else. And so this, somebody was sort of, you know, he's giving me a real hard time about this. I said, no, this is actually what you want, because the worst technology conversations I ever have are ones that start with technology, and the best technology conversations I have are ones that start with another problem like, hey, our kids aren't learning math well, right? Or, uh, you know, we're having trouble with uh, discipline issues in our school or whatever. So that's reflected in this uh, report. So what, what turned out to be a, a, what was a criticism of our office, I actually kind of walked away with going, yeah, we did a good job. I didn't even <laughs> intend to do that, but, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the point. So let me tell you, uh, just to start, about a question I get uh, all the time. Um, so much so that probably if I just charged people a couple bucks every time they ask me the question, I could just retire and not have to go around answering it anymore. Uh, and it's this question that maybe many of you get as well. Uh, it's, does technology really improve uh, learning? 
And um, when I was first in, in my role uh, at the department, I was more polite. And when I'd get that question, I would sort of take the time and, and explain the, my, you know, how you'd answer that question. And, and as time went on and I got more frustrated with hearing that question being asked, uh, my answer got more and more blunt. And uh, now my response is something like, um, well, it's actually a really bad question. <laughs> and shame on you for asking. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't say that. But, but it's, a very, it's a bad question because it, it asks, it, it, I, I know the intent that people are getting at when they ask it is good, I hope, but, but they're missing the point. And so the best way that I found to clarify this as quickly as I possibly can is when somebody says, where's the evidence that technology improves learning? I then say, show me the evidence that paper improves learning. <laughs> and they go, wait, what? No, that's different. I go, no, 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 no. It's not different at all. And I think of examples in, in my own experience, my kids in school and, and at home, where paper has been used in horrible ways, filling out worksheets, doing stuff that just is not very useful. And yet, at, at other times, I read uh, wonderful children's stories that we have and do great activities that are very creative with, with, our, with my kids uh, using paper. And so we should remember that the real question that I think we need to be asking when it comes to technology, especially with young children, is what is it that it's enabling us to do that we couldn't do before? And then ask if that's making a difference. Right? And at first blush, sort of mentioning it very quickly, it may sound like, like splitting hairs. Oh, isn't that the same thing? But as you think about it a little more, it's really a very different thing. Right? So one is saying, does technology make a difference? And the other is saying, let's do stuff that we never could dream of doing before we had technology to enable it. And then we need to be asking, is it working? Is that making a difference? Is it empowering students? Is it closing gaps? Is it connecting families uh, or not? And, and make decisions appropriately. Let me just share uh, in a couple minutes here that I have four roles that I think uh, technology can, can play that are particularly important with young children uh, and young families. And so I'll, I'll run through these very quickly. Um, in fact, I will guarantee it because I'm going to put this up here so I don't keep talking too long. Um, I want to make sure we have some time for, for interaction as well. Uh, four ideas that I think are important, important roles that technology can, can play. The first is this idea of personalized learning, right? Uh, and if any of you, those of you who know me know that this is something that I, I talk about quite a bit. And it's because I'm concerned that in the learning space, in school, um, we tend to do this crazy thing where we take a whole bunch of students who are very different, have different needs and different challenges and different passions, and we put them all in a room and we treat them all the same. And uh, somehow we don't have a problem with that. But yet if you compare that to other industries like, let's say, medicine, Right? If, we, if a doctor treated the 30 patients that came in in one morning the same and prescribed the same medication to them, right? that's crazy. Nobody would stand for that. And everybody would know right off the bat that it's crazy. And yet somehow we don't know that it's crazy that we do that to <laughs> students uh, in schools. And so we're working on leveraging ways to have technology help adjust and adapt the learning experience. And that doesn't mean that they work by themselves on a computer. Let's just be really clear. They can be in groups, they can be working on projects, but it's adjusted and adapted to their needs and their interests. And I, I, I was at a um, panel the other day at the Atlantic uh, um, Live uh, event at the museum, and somebody at the end said, well, I don't know that I like this whole idea of students to just have stuff that's you know, relevant to them. But learning should be hard. You know, back when I learned, and I, it was, but again, it was, it was well-intentioned. I mean, the point was, was well-intentioned. And what I, what I said was, have you ever seen how much harder a kid will work when it feels relevant to them. It is amazing how hard, how many times, look, even if you take something really simple, let's forget the educational value for a second, and look at something like Angry Birds, right? My kid, I have a little kid, who will spend hours and hours and hours trying to, to boost those levels, because for whatever reason, that seems relevant to him. And by the way, when I've been able to find ways to make math relevant, he'll spend just as much time and energy on it. So being uh, relevant and being aligned to their interests and needs is not the same <laughs> as making it, easy, making it easy for them to sort of get away without doing hard stuff and learning. In fact, I would say it's the opposite. So that's the first one. Um, and at some point, if there's interest, if we have a few minutes later, I can talk more about personalized learning, but I just want to leave that out there. The second one is technology is a very powerful ability to visualize learning progress. It's uh, very useful for teachers and parents to be able to get a sense of what a student is actually doing, what their learner is doing as they're moving through this experience. These are three examples from actual schools, actual programs that are using technology that show to the student where they're at, to the kid. And these are young, young children, right? We're not that you can see in some of them. They're nice pictures and 
Um, uh, this one on the on the right there is actually a kind of a high school situation, but it's on their their graphics, and it's easy for them to see what their what their progress is, and um, that's very important because it also uh, provides agency to the student, right, to the learner, because they can use this technology to actually make good, better decisions about their own uh, progress. This is another example. This is a um, this is actually from my kids, uh, a tool that I use with one of them, with my daughter uh, that helps me see. It's a game that she's playing. She doesn't know that she's doing math homework. Uh, don't tell her, please. Uh, she has to go. She gets credit for playing this game. She still thinks I'm a little crazy because she has to play this game before she can go outside. And she's like, well, of course I'll go play this game before I go outside. As she plays the game, I get to see some of the progress that she's making in learning uh, math skills. And um, the other example that I'll give of this, uh, the value of, of visualizing progress, is from a site called Khan Academy, which many of you are familiar with. Um, clearly not a site that's widely used with young children, but, I, but the point of how they show progress is useful enough that I wanted to mention it anyway. And that is that most people know Khan Academy for their videos. And they get all excited about all these video explanations, and they're good, they're good explanations, right? So, so cool. But the thing that's actually useful, I, the most useful about Khan Academy, I believe, is the fact that they built this tool that shows, it's sort of a learning positioning system, if you will, that lets you zoom in and out and see where you're at. So if you want to get to dividing fractions, you have to get through uh, you know, adding and subtracting fractions first, and then basic division. And you can make some choices about where you go. And being able to see that, like a GPS, uh, is very, uh, very helpful. And so if you aren't familiar with that part of Khan Academy, I think that's actually the best example of how the technology can be used. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. And then the other, the, my next piece is this idea of increasing parental involvement. So this is a tool. There's a bunch of tools that do this. This one happens to be a, a, a game called um, Dreambox. Uh, and one of the things that's really great is my poor kids become guinea pigs for everything that I want to try with, with technology. They go on and they work on this game. And I get a message that says, not only here's what your kid did, I mean, that's useful, but it says, here's a game that you can play in the car or in the grocery store. And it, it's always, it says on the run, right? It's always a game. It's always something that you can do that's in a really easy place. You don't have to be in a quiet seat. It's sort of for like real parents who are, if anybody is a parent like me, running around to the next thing, into gymnastics, into somewhere else that I'm late for. And it says, hey, while you're running around like crazy being late to go to the next thing, ask your kid to group things in you know, units of 10. Or in this case, you know, pick a number between 11 and 40 and find ways to divide it into, into equal parts quickly, right? And so I can very it helps me be a better parent because it tees up my role better. I like to think I'm an involved parent, but the, the truth of the matter is I have no idea what my kid does most days in school, right? And so this gives me a cheat sheet. And I'm like, hey, here's this cool game I want to play. And my little son James is like, how did you know? That's exactly what I did today in school. And I'm like, well, you know, parents, we know everything. Uh, but so <laughs> leveraging technology to tee up better engagement from parents and really specific engagement, right? Not just, hey, your kid's doing good, but here's something you can do that is relevant to what they just learned or what they're struggling in, um, I think is very important. Another initiative that I won't spend much time talking about right now uh, for time, but I want to just alert you to is this idea of uh, what we call the My Data button. Um, basically, what we're saying is that as students interact with media, whether they're apps, whether they're sites at school, we believe very strongly that parents need to be empowered with that data, the information about their learner. It's their data, by the way, in case there's any confusion about that. Um, my school loves me when I walk in and I remind them that all the data that they have is actually mine. They're just hosting it for me. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is make it easier for parents to get access to that data. And we want to say, instead of just hitting print on a, on a piece of paper in the office of a school, I should be able to get it as a parent in a, in a digital format so that I can create a learning portfolio, if you will, a learning profile, in the same way that many of you already do that I do uh, with medical records for my, my kids. So I know what shots they've taken out of this portal that I can log into and I can see all that stuff. I don't have that yet, but this is what we're working on, uh, on the education space. And we believe that that's very, very important for enabling um, parents. Last, uh, last piece here is we need to use technology better to make sure we're making it easier to find the best digital learning content uh, for children. And so one of the problems that we found right now is that's actually really, really hard to do. You can do a bunch of searches on Google and sometimes you, you find some stuff and sometimes you don't. And you never really know if it's aligned to certain standards that you're interested in having them teach. And so one of the um, projects that we've started is something called uh, the uh, Learning Registry. And this project basically says that there's a whole bunch of places out on the web that we call portals or sites, whatever you want to call them, where there's groups of content that people have gone through and said, hey, this, this video teaches this particular state or common core or standard or whatever it is, and it's a, or a game or whatever. There's all this media out there, and they've made these alignments. But the only way to get them now is to go and search all those different sites, right? And that's burdensome. And so what we've said is, wouldn't it be better if we could have that media find the parent? 
as opposed to having the parent have to go and find that medium, right? Flip the paradigm. So if we have a parent that can, if there's a portal, if there's something they can log into and know about, you know, approximately what their kid's learning, we can say, here's some good learning media that, that you would probably want to use because other parents that have kids similar to you learning similar things found them very useful. And that's what the Learning Registry does. It's an open database that tracks learning content. It so the best way to describe this is it's like a human genome project for digital learning, digital media. So we go and identify and tag all of the digital content we can find in the world. By the way, when I say we, that's everybody. That's not the Department of Ed. It's everybody who is in the process of identifying, creating uh, digital media. And then, once we have that information in the learning registry, people can build apps on top of it. They can build apps that say, hey, this is an app that's going to help you as a parent find better media. This is an app that's going to help you as a teacher find better media or a student. Uh, and so that's the idea behind uh, the learning registry. And then, so this is an example. We actually have a, a beta site up right now. It's called newfree.ed.gov. I know that's a goofy name. It will eventually be just free.ed.gov, but they want me to call it newfree.ed.gov while we're working on it, so nobody freaks out if some things aren't totally perfect yet. But uh, it's an example where you can go in and start searching some of the media that's coming out of the, the learning registry. And anybody can build tools on top of it. And so let me end by saying uh, there are a couple important considerations that I think we need to keep in mind as we're looking and thinking about how uh, technology is being used with, uh, with children. And the first is, as I mentioned before, as I sort of kicked off with my paper example, how do we know what works, right? And I would suggest that the traditional model of take a group of students or children and give them a thing, give them X, give them device, give them software, take another group of students and give them not that thing, not that software, let that run for a year, then study the data for a year, and then come back and say that this worked or didn't work, doesn't really fit the paradigm anymore, because whatever the answer to that question is, that technology that they're, they're evaluating is long morphed into something else. So it doesn't matter. If you said, yes, it worked really good, it doesn't matter. It's now turned into, you know, that's like, a year is like a thousand light years in technology iteration cycles, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to get better at adapting our research practices and models to uh, the speed at which technology is being developed. And unfortunately, what I see is we go, well, we know there's this gold standard of random control trial, and so when we can't do that, we'll go with the next best thing, which is, it's blue. I like blue. We'll go with that one, right? And that's not good enough. And so we have to have some other ways that are still based on evidence, uh, but that are uh, able to happen much faster. And so we have a, a report that's up on our website. We just released this. Again, our website is ed.gov slash technology. And it sets up a whole variety of different approaches for trying to figure out what works in the learning space that happen much, much more quickly. And by the way, if you want to cheat and go right to the chart that shows what the models are, it's on page 78. So you don't even have to read the whole thing. You can jump right to the chart. Um, it is a long report. Somebody told me they were complimenting me. They said it's, it's dense in its brilliance. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so you can cheat, right? Jump to the table at the end that shows the different models if you want to. And then the last piece that I'll mention is this idea of ensuring equity. So um, we need to be careful and, and realize that um, that in order to, there's all these sort of advantages that I talked about, teeing up parents, making sure that the data is being used to help find the best digital learning content, but that falls apart if everybody doesn't have access. Um, and so there are some interesting, there's some projects underway right now that you should know about. So in case I get hit by a bus on the way out of here, which is likely in DC, I want to make sure you know about two things. One of them is called uh, Connect to Compete, or, or Everyone On is the other, is sort of the way they're marketing it. Um, this is a project between the FCC and some of the cable internet providers that are basically saying we will make sure that there's high speed internet for families uh, of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch across the country. It's a great program. And the other one is one I was hoping to be able to tell you about today, and I've been <clears throat> um, told that we are not, I can't uh, give any additional information at the moment, but coming soon, there will be some good information about some things that is, are happening at the administration. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry, I could go. Yeah, but, but, but let me tell you, in all seriousness, um, some amazingly hard work. There are a lot of people that have not slept for a long time to look at some ways to get schools connected to broadband internet. Um, it may shock you to know, it should shock you to know this, that about 80% of schools do not have access to broadband internet in the classroom. They might be in the front <laughs> office, but they don't in the classroom. And that's a tragedy, and we have to fix that. Um, and so I would end with this, which was a, a New York Times article that many of you may be aware of. And if you're not, I want to aware you of it. And that is uh, this uh, uh, research that was done, study that was done, that looked at digital media use. And it showed that students, uh, children, and families of higher socioeconomic status 
had access to media and used it in very productive ways for creating, for learning. You know, we have a, I have a rule in my house about screen time. I really don't care about screen time. I care about is it creative time or is it passive time? And that's the rule that, that my, my kids have to use, right? And so you see much more creative time, much more, more um, uh, what I'm calling sort of useful uh, time on the technology. And when you looked at lower socioeconomic status uh, children, it was uh, essentially passive video watching, movie watching. And that is a, a digital divide that does not get closed. In fact, it gets exacerbated by uh, increasing connectivity. And so we have to be very cognizant about how we're helping reimagine the learning experience and helping teachers and parents know that getting technology does not equal uh, making better choices with it, which is, again, back to our National Ed Tech Report and why it's so important that these conversations don't start about the technology, but about how we want to improve learning. And with that, yeah. thanks.